Welcome to the Auburn Film Room. I'm Lauren Sisler. This is Cole Kublik. Auburn entering week five of the season, coming off a big hold win on against. Hold on a second before you go. So, since you guys decided to try and have a little fun earlier this week, you and your buddy John Parker. Cole Kublik looking good. I want to point out on the toaster at his red tie. He's a big Auburn guy, but wearing red, looking pretty good. Props in red. for him, right there. Props for him. So I just wanted everyone who. You guys tried to have your little fun prank and play. I mean, you, you can tell me. Wait, we're recording right now? What color the tie is right yeah. now. So it's up to you. And if we need to put it closer to the camera, I mean, we can. I don't know. It was hot out there. It was hard to see. It was sunny. You hard know. to see. OK. Colors, playing with your eyes. So what color would you say that is? Uh, I would go rust. I like rust. Rust works. But by the way, John Parker Wilson pointed out that it was a red tie, not tie. Oh yeah, he tweeted at me during the game and then he tries to play pranks in here. So just wanted everyone to know, there's the tie. It's not red. The not red tie. Or crimson. Let's talk about this Auburn football team, if you will. The defense looking great. The Auburn. Yeah, shaking the rust off the defense. I was about to say that. You can't take my line. Sorry. Okay, so Auburn defense, LSU defense. Both look fantastic. They did a great job out there. Auburn offense, they need help, especially in the red zone. But if you could talk about one specific area and describe to me what was the key point for Auburn in winning this football game, what gave them the edge over LSU in this game? Uh, I would say the replay booth. <laughs> See, I knew you were going to come at me with that. I already told you before we started this not to go with the replay booth, but go ahead. I'll let you, I'll let you finish. Still, I, I thought Auburn moved the ball fairly well. Um, and the defense would be the reason they were able to stay in this game and win this game. You have to give a lot of credit to Daniel Carlson. You hit six field goals in a game. It's impressive. I don't really ever go crazy for kickers. I'm not a huge fan of kickers, but he's one of the reasons that Auburn won the football game. But the offense still got him in the position to make those kicks. And, of course, Auburn's defense kept LSU from scoring at critical times, in particular the end of the game. So. Uh, it was it was more of a team effort, I think. I mean, I don't think they're real dominant in either area. Both both sides of the ball, all three facets did some things well, and all three had some breakdowns, which obviously we'll take a look at. Yeah, we'll look at this play right here that was critical. Carl Lawson sack there on a, a second and ten on the fourteen here. Twenty eight seconds left on the clock. Critical moment. Just shows you that that Carl Lawson really can be an elite edge guy and why some people still have him early second late first round projection just watch the speed rush just a dip and run right around the edge and on the blind side of quarterback Danny Etling so he's going to affect the pocket he's going to affect the pocket quickly only going to have to bring four and that's what's key because that gives you the numbers on the back end Lauren and that's what helps so you'll show blitz and then Auburn's going to back off you'll see a little bit of a twist in the middle didn't even need that twist and it's supposed to really be getting help. K.J. Malone at left tackle is from Leonard Fournette. Doesn't even get that help from Fournette because Lawson is so quick around the edge. This is what you expect to see from Carl Lawson. This is what we all thought going into the season. If he's healthy, he can make this defense be very different. And it's plays like that that if he stays healthy the rest of the year can potentially help Auburn's defense come one of the better ones in the league. Okay, we go to the other side, Auburn's offense. Last week you told me... This doesn't rest solely on the shoulders of the offensive line. Your thoughts coming into this game after watching game film and what this offensive line provided or lack thereof? Well, I thought they played well in spots in the game. Similar to Texas A&M, you're facing an elite defender, Miles Garrett. I don't think Arden Key is much different. We mentioned that last week going into this game. He's someone who has great size. Elite speed off the edge, similar to what we just saw from Carl Lawson. So he can break your pocket down and he can affect your pocket in one-on-ones. And if you don't dedicate extra players to him, he's going to cause problems. So, Lauren, Sean White has to understand as he's rolling out, mental clock needs to be operating a little bit faster with an edge rusher with elite speed bearing down from the backside. So in man on the line of scrimmage, sometimes not going to have a blocker for him. So as White sprints out left, you'll see the offensive line sort of swing and gate. Nobody there for Arden Key. Now, you would say, okay, protection breaks down in front of Sean White. Devin Godchow, 57, is going to run through. It's true, and Austin Golson needs to stay with that block a little bit longer. But when I watch him roll out, I feel like there's plenty of time to either throw that football away or make a, a decision a little bit more quick to get rid of that football. Golson has to maintain that block, but even if, even if Devin Godchow doesn't come running through late, I think Arden Key makes this sack. 
and Sean White's just not going to have an opportunity to make a play. So mentally, this is where experience comes into play. And a quarterback that's been doing this for two, three, four years is going to have a better understanding of this is who I'm going up against. This is the play that's called. These are the possibilities. So I need to make sure I handle that pre-snap before I actually run the play. Lauren, we'll talk more about Arden Key, an elite defender, like we mentioned, a guy who can make plays. You see how he's going to walk over late. Also, watch the alignment of this defensive tackle. So they're both going to be widened out a little bit. He's basically lined up on the offensive tackle as well as Arden Key, just visually to kind of do something different and throw you off. But, I mean, this is just an elite speed rush from Arden Key on Austin Golson. Hips must stay square to the line of scrimmage. Don't open up that back foot because you give a direct line to the quarterback. So if we go back and pause it, and you see Austin Golson here, how those hips are open to the sideline. So he's square this way to the sideline. That's going to give a direct path to a speed rusher to be able to get to the quarterback, as opposed to hips staying square to the line of scrimmage, and Arden Key is going to have to fight through that outside shoulder to be able to get to the quarterback. It's causing the most conflict to be able to get to the pocket and disrupt the quarterback. Not taking place here. And then even the push up the middle is something that is problematic as well. Tayshawn Bauer, Arden Key both really affecting the pocket on this play. And we've seen it with the Auburn tackles all season. They've had issues with speed rushers. This time both guys meet Sean White in the pocket. This has nothing to do with a mental clock or understanding when to leave the pocket. This is just two guys getting beat to the outside. Okay, I want to look at Auburn's red zone offense. They got into the red zone five times, ended up having to kick six field goals. In your opinion, was this coaching or was this play calling? Well, you look at the plays that down by the goal line, and people say, well, Kendall Beck with 52 just ran through linebacker for LSU, and he went unblocked. You know, how can you do that? That's not on coaching. The players know the assignments. And two really nice double teams on the third down play, right guard, right tackle, center and left guard, get nice push. But you have to understand the goal line, things happen quick on the goal line, much quicker than they happen anywhere else on the field. So your normal double team that you're able to work into and then come off on a linebacker, down on the goal line, it doesn't develop that way. It doesn't have time to develop. So it's in and out. It's immediate, and it happens right away. So that's just a pre-snap mental read for the offensive lineman. Whoever it was, if it was the center supposed to come off or the right guard to come off, they have to know before that ball snapped, more than likely, I'm going to need to depart this double team a little bit early to be able to make this block. Because if it's even a body on a body on Kendall Beckwith, it's probably going to be a touchdown. And same thing on the fourth down play. He rolls across to the opposite gap, and the offensive lineman just have to know. It happens quickly. And so you have to come off on your assignment and know that it's going to happen fast. So to me, that's more execution than it is coaching or play calling. Everyone wants it to be play calling because that's the hot topic of the week. And is Malzahn calling plays? Is Lashley? Why is he giving it up to Lashley? What's going on? I think everyone wants it to be that. But when you get down inside the five and you're allowing an inside linebacker, one of the better players on this defense, to just run through the A-gap, that's not on coaching. That's execution.